Hello, this is Father David, uh, here with chapter 29 of the Lenten Spring, The Good of His Neighbor. This really piggybacks on the prayer and fasting that we talked about last chapter, but it provides the essential context that I think really every Orthodox ought to be very familiar with, and that of that is of hospitality and the love of neighbor and the example that our fasting uh, should provide and should never provide for those around us. Obviously, we're supposed to fast in secret. Obviously, we're not doing this for the glory or, you know, to impress anybody. However, you know, we eat in public. We eat with people. Sometimes people come over to our house and there's, uh, you know, social gatherings. And so somebody will bring something and provide food. And, you know, what do we do? There is, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, hospitality that needs to be shown. And so Father Tom uh, talks about uh, there was a, uh, uh, you know, some of the desert fathers, you know, some of the first monks that went out into the desert and um, people would come out to see them and they knew like, oh, these are the holy men, you know, out in the desert fasting and praying and then they would come, they'd come a long ways and these fathers in their great fasting would provide them bread, wine, you know, refreshing them, <coughs> other things as well and they would, you know, eat and drink with these people. And uh, at one point it got so bad, Father Tom alludes to this, that, uh, you know, some of the disciples came to these people that, you know, came to visit them and said, please don't visit them anymore. And why? Because, well, what you don't know is that, you know, when they share one piece of bread with you, they deny themselves two after you leave and they're by themselves. Every cup of wine that they offer you and that they share with you, they deny themselves two cups of water afterwards. You're going to kill them, you know. But the point of it was that they uh, wanted to be hospitable. They wanted to provide for these people, uh, you know, hospitality out of love for the neighbor. Uh, now, obviously, their monastic fast was not going to be the same as the Lenten fast, the fast that the entire church uh, is involved with together. But it's instructive about, uh, you know, how they saw fasting. But also, Father Tom uh, makes a, an excellent point. It's also about how they saw the other person. Uh, they would quote the, the saying of Christ when uh, the Pharisees asked, you know, why do you and your disciples, you know, uh, not fast like you know you're supposed to um because they were john's disciple john the baptist disciples and the pharisees they were fasting but christ and his disciples were not and christ says can you fast when the bridegroom is with you there'll come a day when the bridegroom is taken away you know he'll be crucified and and ascend into heaven and then they will fast well for these desert fathers every person that came into their lives was christ and they treated them as Christ. They loved them as Christ. That's a beautiful uh, mindset. Uh, so they would fast in secret and they would eat in public. And Father Tom says, sometimes we do, you know, exactly the opposite. You know, we fast or if we, you know, invite friends who are fasting over, then we fast. But then when we're alone, we break the fast and we eat and we... Uh, are undisciplined, and we don't do the hard work of denying ourselves when no one else is around. Um, however, you know, there's really, uh, you know, a situational ethics that's going on here. And Father Tom basically said, he admits the teaching about fasting and hospitality with other people, he says it's delicate and subtle. It's another way of saying this can be thorny. It can be tricky. What do I do in this situation? What do I do in that situation? 
Uh, but it should be clear to those willing to understand it in purity of heart, he says. The good of one's neighbor is the only absolute law. So, for example, especially during like the nativity fast, when, you know, there's, you know, Christmas parties going on and everything, people will often, if you're at the office party or you're over at somebody's house and they're not orthodox, and they say, hey, you know, look, I, I made these and I'm really kind of proud of my deviled eggs. Would you like one? And they don't know you're fasting, hopefully. The, the, the law of the church would say to take one deviled egg, you know, enough to uh, accept what's been given to you and say, thank you so much. And maybe even eat it in front of them, you know, to thank them for what they've given to you. You have been a good guest and a gracious uh, and thankful recipient of what they took the time to make for you. You know, I mean, I, and, you know, I've, I've had people come to me and, and say this exact same thing. It's like, Father, it was like, and this might be mean to say in the middle of the Lenten fast, but like some guy was just forlorn because he had a, a bacon wrapped jalapeno popper. And I'm like, well, did they make it for, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, they brought it and it was kind of awkward and I didn't want to, I'm like, great. I hope you enjoyed it, you know, but you didn't go out looking for it, right? You didn't go, you know, making an excuse to go find that. It was given to you. And um, y'all never forget what uh, uh, Father Paul Tarazzi uh, said one time. It, it kind of shocked us in class, but he kind of, that was what he did. Uh, he said, you know, if you are, uh, if, if someone offers you a chicken dinner on Great and Holy Friday, you know, they don't know or something, and you don't eat the chicken, don't come to my church for Pascha, for communion, you know? Um, so great is the idea. Now that's obviously an extreme example, but I will tell you a story about what happened with Matushka and myself when we were brand new Orthodox. And I've told this story before, but we just, that, that had not been something that we had been taught yet. It was great and Holy Friday on one of these years like now, like this year, where Pascha is much later than Western Easter. We were graduating from college. We were about to get married. Our families, who are not Orthodox, had come to town and were providing a, a wedding shower. They were, you know, at a graduation party and it was this thing. Well, they didn't know that on great and Holy Friday, we try not to eat at all. And they prepared us a whole thing. Stupidly, we did not eat. And it was awkward. And if I had to go back and do it again, I'd have filled my plate. Maybe not fill my plate, but you know, put a little bit of everything on there to thank them for their trouble, you know? But, you know, it, it, it's so, you know, don't be like Father David, right? Um, now, on the other hand, there is the issue of those who do know that you're fasting. And so in those cases, you know, as Orthodox Christians, it would be scandalous to them to break the fast in some sort of, of way. So, for example, there have been people that for various reasons, uh, mainly if they're new to the faith or if their families are divided, right? Like one spouse might be Orthodox and come into the church and the other spouse would hold back and say, no, you know, uh, and, and, and at least at for that point, they're divided in terms of faith. And the other spouse is maybe preparing the food. And so in order to keep the peace, pastorally, you go to your priest, you say, is this possible to have a modified fast at home? I say, well, to keep the, I, I have said to people in particular situations, you know, to keep the peace, uh, you know, try, you know, try this modification or that modification. Don't throw the fast completely out the window. Definitely stop eating before you are full, you know, continue to be a little hungry. Uh, but so that you keep the peace, do X, Y, or Z. However, when you come to coffee hour on Sunday and there's only Lenten fare, eat the Lenten fare, you know, don't, you know, be bringing 
cream cheese to put on your bagel, you know. Although I will say, I mean, and this is the other thing, is that, at, you know, local traditions are what they are. We went to seminary and, you know, where we were, they had out cream cheese and other stuff, you know, during fasting periods. You just roll with it. And if people put it on there, maybe they need protein and you don't know, you know. The point is that you look at your plate and not theirs. It's the prayer of St. Ephraim, which we've been doing. Teach me, you know, uh, you know to, uh, yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother. So it's difficult, <laughs> but it's always, uh, regardless, it is guided by love for the neighbor so that you won't offend them, so that you won't scandalize them. You know, we, we live in a, in a world where so often people have now, especially in American culture, this opinion of, by God, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I've got my rights and I'm going to do it however I want. And if people don't like it, that's their problem. And then, you know, we even go to, to lengths to be overtly offensive and we, and then people will say, you know, ah, if you're all concerned about offending other people, they're just too easily offended, you know, and they just need to get over it. Now, I do know people that I would say, yeah, about certain things, that is the case. And if you think that you're going to get through life without being offended, you got another thing coming. However, for Christians, it is no sign of weakness to be concerned about offending other people. In fact, it is a very heroic spiritual effort and a virtue that we would consider what is going to offend someone. And St. Paul said he had every right to eat, in his case, meat offered to idols. That's Father Tom mentions it in this chapter. And it's what we read as we enter into the fast from food. And he says, you know, meat, eating this meat, it's lawful for me. It's fine. Christ is greater than any idol, any demon that that meat might have been offered to. It's not a sin for me to do that. And it's my right as a baptized Christian. I can do it. I'm free to do it. And nobody could say boo. However, if it scandalizes my brother, if someone is pushed away from the assembly because I, you know, stand on my rights. So then I'll never eat meat again. And that is the, the heroic, humble Christian virtue, you know? And so it's a difficult pill for many Americans to swallow uh, I kind of think sometimes Texans have a double dose of that whole, you know, you know, my way, my rights type of a thing. But we are truly walking in the example of the Desert Fathers when we exercise that humility and we put our own desires and rights to the side so that we can serve and love our neighbor. Again, this is what it's all about. You know, the greater, uh, the greater love is to lay down your life, to lay down your agenda for the good and benefit of, of others, whatever that is. Whether it's to eat what's graciously given to you to break the fast, you know, in a moment, or to keep a strict fast so that you strengthen the other brethren that are fasting with you so that you don't scandalize them or cause them to, you know, enter into temptation or whatever. Or I don't know, talk about jalapeno poppers in the middle of a fast and get them thinking about food, sorry. But, <clears throat> you know, this is our, our uh, goal. This is our challenge. This is our calling uh, to engage in fasting, not only for our own benefit, but for love of our brother. So may God bless you all, and Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.